Now let's look at some example of time series data or also known as sequence data. Whenever time matters in your data or the notion of sequence order, it makes sense to store it in a 3D tensor with an explicit time axis. One example will be the extension of the PIMA diabetes data set. We will look at a concrete example in the next slide. Here, um, what we want to understand is that all the features that we have for each individual, let's say I have my person P1 with attributes such as age equals 65, height equals, let's say, 6 inch, and so on. So all these attributes will sit in here. And if we didn't have time, then um, what we would have is a table of um, records for each person. So this is a person P1 and, um, sorry, this is another person P2, P3, and so on. So here we can see that this axis here represents the samples. And then this axis here um, represents the features. What are the various features we have, as, etc., etc. Now, time step simply adds one more dimension by recording. Maybe this is in time T1, maybe this is in time T2, the same person's attributes in a different time, in another time, and so on. Usually, the time axis is always the second axis with axis index 1 um, by convention. This is um, typically what it's, done, what it's done. Now, let's look at an example. So here's the PIMA diabetes data set. And um, here's, let's say this is the initial table. So in year one, here's what we have. A number of pregnancies all the way down, glucose all the way down, blood pressure all the way down, all the way up to the final outcome. That is whether somebody is diabetic or not. Diabetic or not. And let's say we collect this data in the first year, so first year, then this becomes a two-dimensional data, 2D data, because we have um, each individuals in the row and each of the attributes in the column, right? Now, if we collect this data over time, say we do the same thing and repeat this for the second year as well, so this is second uh, year, then we get similar data. So here this is um, year one, year two, and let's say this is year three, and this is year four. So we get four tables. Earlier, we had a two-dimensional data, and then now we have collected this for four years. So what we actually have is a three-dimensional data, 3D data, whose um, uh, fourth dimension, whose third dimension is four, um, because um, this is the, uh, let's say, number of rows, number of columns of the table, and then uh, times four, because we have uh, data for four years. So this is how, with time series information in a data, we our data increases its uh, number of dimensions from 2D to uh, 3D. To further more clearly understand how uh, we may have examples of four-dimensional and uh, 4D and uh, five-dimensional data, what are the examples, right? So what are the examples of these? We will take consider um, image as um, the example. Um, images typically have three dimensions height, width, and color depth. Um, why three? Because um, uh, if you remember, when we look at a picture, we only see two dimensions, right? There's a person sitting, and then um, we have its height, and we have its width. So we only see two dimensions. But like I said before, only grayscale images have two dimensions because each pixel is intensity of um, how dark or um, how light the pixel should be. But in case of color images, we actually need to maintain three different channels, three different matrices. The first one usually for red, the second one for green, and the third one for blue.
So for this reason, images are three-dimensional tensors or three-dimensional matrices. Although grayscale images like the MNIST digits, which we'll talk about more, have only a single color channel and could thus be stored in 2D tensors. But um, image tensors by default are always 3D with one dimensional color channel for um, grayscale images, but uh, usually three dimensional uh, channels or, or three channels for um, color images. So for color images, we actually have um, three channels. What this means is, um, let's look at an example. Say we have a batch of 128 grayscale images of size 256 by 256. So each image is of dimensions 256 by 256. And then we have 128 of them. So they could be stored in a tensor of shape like this. So what this means is I can create a 128 by 256 by 256 tensor. And um, in my zeroth position, I can store the first image. In my first position, I can store the second image and so on. So a tensor of this shape is actually sufficient to store these 128 images. But usually, instead of creating a tensor of this shape, we add one more dimension to this tensor so that we not just have 128 by 256 by 256, but instead 128 by 256 by 256 by 1. So this one here, even though this is redundant, allows us to understand what happens when we go to color. So if, if we have 128 color images, what tensor shape do we need? So if we have 128 color images, then the tensor shape we need is 128 by 256 by 256 by three. So this is for storing red, green, and blue channels. Usually to represent images, there are two conventions. The first convention is the channels last convention, which is used by TensorFlow. For example, we specify the channel at the end uh, or the last dimension. So channel becomes your, your last dimension. And the opposite convention is to use channels first. And this is used by Theano and um, other libraries like PyTorch. Since we are using TensorFlow, we will always just stick to the channel's last dimension. Say we have a tensor that looks like this. We have um, samples, so this is my first image. Here's my second image, and here's my third image. So this is my first, second, and third image. We have the image's height, we have the width, and these three channels represent the color channels. So, um, and then this axis overall represents the samples. So the question is, is this channels first or is this channels last? The answer is we don't know. The reason being, it depends how we feed these this tensor into a TensorFlow model, TF model, and how we interpret it. So um, even though the data looks like this, I could say it's um, channels last because um, height, width, and channels, right? I could also say channels first because I might process this dimension first and then width, height, and then the samples dimension. So we can't really tell by um, the, how the data is, is um, visually out there. However, if we are given how this data is represented or the actual shape is known, say for example, I have number of samples, 128 by 128 by let's say three, then I can tell that this is a channel's last. Now let's look at some examples of 4D tensor. And uh, we actually already saw how 4D tensor looks like because we saw how we had uh, 
the number of images image size let's say 128 by 128 and the number of um, channels in the image so this is actually already a 4d tensor now let's see an example of a 5d tensor with uh, video data is an example video data is one of the few types of real world data for which we need five dimensional tensors a video is a sequence of frames each frame being a color image so um, one color image uh, each frame can actually be stored in a 3d tensor because it's height weight and color depth right so this is one frame one frame and a sequence of frames can be stored in a 4D tensor. So if I have um, 15 frames, then um, this can be stored in a, a 4D tensor. Thus, a batch of different videos can be stored in a 5D tensor. Um, so 4D can represent, 4D can represent one small video but um, 5D will be used to represent N uh, videos. So thus, a, a batch of different videos can be stored in a 5D tensor of shape samples. This is the number of videos. And um, how many frames each video has? Number of frames per video the height width of each image each image in the video and uh, the number of channels number of channels usually r g b in each image now this assumes that you understand that actually um, a video is nothing but a collection of frames. So video equals collection of images, right? So if I have a few hundred images um, sitting one after the other and if I change the images one by one, that eventually plays as a video. Now let's look at a concrete example, a numerical example actually. So a 60 second, 144 by 256 YouTube video clip. So the dimensions of the video are 144 pixels by 256 pixels. It's a 60 second long video and it has four frames per second, which means that in one second, there are four pictures, four frames. So that means in 60 seconds, we have 60 times four, that is 240 images or frames. Or frames. So we have 240 frames. So basically the dimension would be something like um, 240 by 144 by 256 if it's a color then it would be by three so this is um, this one single video a batch of four sorts of videos clips would be stored in a tensor of shape yes four videos each of size to each of size 144 by 256 each having 240 frames and three channels. So this is what the tensor shape will be to store four, four such video clips. So this is a total of 106, 106,000, 168,320 values. So if you multiply that, multiply all of these numbers, then this is what you get. Too big, right? If the data type of this tensor was floor 32, then each value would be stored in 32 bits. So the tensor would represent 405 megabytes. Now, does that make sense? That is, um, will four video clips each of 60 seconds, that is one minute. So four clips, 
one minute each total will be 405 megabytes that sounds a, a little bit higher i mean that sounds a lot more storage need but numpy wise or um, tensorflow raw data wise this is exactly true now usually videos are smaller videos are um, smaller because they are compressed compressed using techniques like mpz format that's why the actual size is smaller but if we have to load um, this um, these videos into numpy arrays or tensors then they will actually end up occupying such a large space in in the memory